three. Well, here we are once again. Very lovely and very sunny corner of Glenwood and Lunt. We are in the heart of Rogers Park. And we are up here on the stage at the Heartland Cafe. Um, my microphone is being switched right in front of my eyes. And um, I don't know if this one is working. Go. Hello. 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 Uh, is everything working? Good morning, everybody. Hello. Here we are once again at the very lovely and sunny corner of Glenwood and Lunt. But it's not so sunny. We're going to brighten up your lives. <laughs> you are listening to the Live from the Heartland show. I'm Michael James. I'm here with Katie Hogan. And we have a, a really wonderful lineup of uh, friends, old and new. We're going to have uh, Anthony Roberts, uh, an author and a reporter for the Red Eye. We're going to have our old friend Marilyn Katz, who in the midst of the Democratic Convention, or just as it's about to start, will talk to us about Republicans and women, elections, voter suppression, and what people ought to be think about doing in the months to come. And Dennis Cunningham, a civil rights attorney, my first lawyer, and he is renowned for his work on the Fred Hampton, Attica, and Judy Bari cases. We're going to talk a little bit about Labor Day and the ongoing struggle for justice and democracy. So, yeah, let's, let's start off. What do you, you know, got, Kate? It's, it's, uh, it's weird. Uh, I don't think talking about Republicans and women has a really long uh, piece to say. Let's not even talk about Republicans and women. But they're not good for each other. <laughs> okay. They don't work real well. All right. That, that, I guess uh, Marilyn, you'll have to curtail whatever you were going to no, no, say. No, no. Because no. uh, we just took that out of the script. No. <laughs> just what do you got, Kate? Good morning, Anthony Roberts. Uh, good morning, guys. Welcome to Live from the Heartland. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Anthony walked into the Heartland with a pile of books not too long ago. And he said, uh, can I leave some of these books here? And I said, well, we don't necessarily uh, take books. We have uh, some new uh, people uh, involved with the store. And uh, I said, you know what might work better is that we have you on the radio show. And then, like all of the guests who come on the radio show happen to be prolific writers or first time writers, we'll put your books in the store. So he gave me a book. I uh, proceeded to lose it. <laughs> and then I got another one, and I started reading it, and it sucked me right in, as they say. I'm so glad it did. And at 5.30 this morning, I got up and read the last 60 pages, and it's, it's really a great book. It's like uh, you. about, uh, you know, it's in an African-American neighborhood. A young guy uh, goes off to college. Uh, he's got himself a girlfriend. He discovers a lot of things about his life through some odd events. Yeah. How about filling us in and what you, uh, how you see your book? Uh, sure. Uh, the title is Filling in the Blanks. Um, it's basically a coming of self story uh, about a guy who is un underpaid, overworked, and he's just generally unhappy with the person that he is, which is the story of a lot of people, but a lot of people don't have, you know, that chutzpah or that push to do anything about it. But the protagonist uh, named Michael Blanchard uh, in this novel, he meets another guy who kind of gives him that push. And through a series of events, he changes his entire life in the course of seven days. And I wrote the book to really inspire people to become the person that they want to become. There's a lot of people who have dreams deferred or put their real passions on the back burner because they think that they can't achieve those things, whether they've gotten a little bit older in age or if they haven't had formal training. And the point of the book was just really to inspire people that you can be whoever you want to be at any anytime you'd want to be it. So I'm glad that you got sucked in. I've been getting some really good response on the book. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you liked it. Well, tell us about who you are and what you want to be and how you got to where you're at. Well, a little bit about me. Um, I am a writer and first time author now. I also write for The Red Eye here in Chicago. And I've been writing professionally since I was 21 years old. So we're talking about seven, eight years here. And this is the person I've always wanted to be. I've always known I wanted to be a writer since I was 10 years old. And it's just something that's innate. It's my passion. Uh, I love storytelling. I love being able to connect with people. And this was the first book that I really, really wanted to resonate with people. I really wanted them to grab on to the characters, care about the characters, and kind of see themselves in the characters as well. Anthony Roberts, how, uh, how long did you uh, work on this book? I mean, is it something you've been working on it for a while? Did you finally sit down and just do some big chunks? Uh, as an aspiring writer myself, I'm always interested in the process that people go through 
before they or until they actually get it done? Well, to be 100% honest with you, I wrote the book in four months from the hours of midnight to 7 a.m. every night I wrote it. And I was actually almost homeless at the time that I was writing the book. And I was at a place where I needed to occupy my mind and my, my time and my space. And I had had the idea for this book for a few years, but I hadn't been able to actually put it down to paper. So during this time where I was having a financial uh, hiccup, I guess you would say, I went and wrote the book. And even that story, is something that would tell people that even at your lowest point, you can make something positive out of the situation. So it took me four months. Um, after that, I got back on my feet, and now we're here talking about the book. Pretty cool. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Where'd you go to school? I went to Northern Illinois University, and I also went to Columbia College, which is an awesome, awesome place for anybody creative. I would definitely tell anybody who is passionate about writing, music, acting, Columbia is definitely somewhere that you would We love be. Columbia, actually. I was teaching there when I conceptualized uh, a mini progressive economy, which led to the Heartland Cafe. So I am ah. indebted forever, and many others should be too, that uh, Columbia College fostered some creative juices in my yes. own self. Yes. Uh, where'd you go to high school? I uh, went to uh, Kenwood Academy here in Chicago. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, in Hyde Park. Manny Potemkin went there too, the guy who played Che Guevara in oh, really? on Broadway, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, All I didn't right. know that. Uh, well, you know, one of the things that piqued my interest, Anthony, was that you write for the Red Eye. Yes. And uh, the Red Eye is not something I, I read regularly. It's, uh, it's kind of a... Uh, a USA Today on a local level around culture yeah. it leaves out the sports section. I guess there's a little in there. Uh, tell us a bit how you uh, how you got hooked up with the Red Eye, and there weren't there two. One was the Tribune, one was the Sun Times. I guess this is the one that was with the Tribune. Yes, yes. And uh, fill us in, fill in the blanks on that one. All right. Well, basically. Um I'm the kind of person that anything that I read, I would want to actually contribute to. I would want to write for it. So when I would be riding around or traveling around the city, I would always pick up a red eye and I would just look at it and say, hey, I, I can do that. So I just kind of looked at who was in charge there, who the editorial staff was, and I contacted them. And they looked at my clips from previous work that I've done. I've written for a lot of music magazines in the yeah, past. Yeah, I saw that you had. I looked at, uh, when I went to Google you, it was like you had a whole lot of places, magazines yeah. I don't know, but they certainly piqued my interest. Yeah, a lot of magazines like uh, Vibe and Double XL, like younger music magazines. We carry and Vibe. <laughs> I, I wanted to basically do something uh, meaningful in my city, in Chicago. And the Red Eye really reaches a lot of people. It reaches a younger demographic, and I really wanted to speak to that demographic. So I talked to uh, Mike Hines, who's the editor over there. He welcomed me in with open arms. And I started doing uh, cover stories for the weekend edition of the Red Eye, which was discontinued. And then I later freelanced with some reporting, and now I'm a columnist. So I get a chance to give my opinion about whatever's going on in the city, and it, it's a wonderful relationship. What a cool deal. So how often does your column come out in the red eye? Uh, anytime I have a strong opinion about something. Um, <laughs> I had a column <laughs> in well, the Well, we're going to try to prod you a little bit, so you'll have a lot of strong opinions by the time you get out of here. Yeah. I actually had a column uh, in the paper yesterday, which was talking about the book, but also talking about... Um, physical books versus ebooks and everybody nowadays you know is very much so into their tablets and kindles and e-readers which filling in the blanks is available on kindle as well but i fell in love with actual tangible books and i feel like that's something that we you. should not allow to go the same way that vhs tapes and cds have gone because there's just something about being able to pick up and hold and have a book in your hand that is a magical experience to me. Well, I got to admit that I, uh, I've been going on uh, online for many years now and reading the New York Times and even figuring out how I can do it without paying for it, which my brother <laughs> challenges me on. Why would you do that? But yeah. I got to say, this Michael, morning I came we over sell here. sell the New York Times. I know. Well, I, I, that's why <laughs> I figure I shouldn't pay I'd for it. Just put that in there. <laughs> but I, 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 do, uh, I did pick up the New York Times today, the hard copy. And I do that, you know, every now and then, and it's really much more fun to read it in yeah. a newspaper than yeah. online. And there is a good story in there about uh, South Africa and the struggle with the miners that's going on. So I call your attention to that. Uh, what kind of plans do you have? Well, 
I really, really want to have as many people find out about the book in a very organic um, way. I want it to be something that I don't push on you, but you hear from a friend, hey, you guys might want to read this, check this out. So I have a book signing that I'm securing the location for, for the end of uh, next month. Um, so you guys are all invited, all the listeners, and you guys will definitely be invited. And I'm also uh, working on my second book right now, which, well, I'm actually working on two books at the same time. It's a sure you are. prequel to filling in the blanks, which kind of gives a little more insight about some of the characters the that characters. were introduced um, beforehand and just kind of giving a little bit of backstory and also a book that I'm calling uh, These Are Not The Answers, which is basically um, kind of almost inspirational, motivational to where I really, again, want to inspire people to follow their dreams, follow their passions, follow their goals. And a lot of times they look to people who are experts or gurus and I'm not an expert of anything, but I feel like oh, I might, might be able to give one. you... It's I, clear I you're be. on the track. I could be. I, 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 just, I just feel that people get the best advice from friends or from people that they know. So I just want to talk to people in that friendly voice to say, hey, you can do whatever you'd like to do. So I'm kind of working on two books right now and making sure that everybody knows about filling in the blanks. Anthony Roberts, I really enjoyed filling in the blanks. And uh, I, I'm going to ask you if you will fill in a little bit more depth about the characters and the story so that... Uh, without giving too much away. I mean, this kid, Michael Blanchard, Mike Blanchard, uh, his, uh, his girlfriend, his uh, maybe to be father-in-law in the Could future. Be. Could be. Uh, his, his dad, his mom. I mean, there, there were some really neat characters. And uh, what really, at first, I, when I first started reading, I thought I was reading, it was taking place in New York. And then I went, wait a minute. And all of a sudden, there's Ashland Avenue. And there's 73rd Street. Yeah. And uh, there's the Dan Ryan. And there's downtown. And it's just a... Yeah. Uh, it's a Chicago-based book, and um, it's, uh, it's really neat. Can you give us a little more in insight into the characters? I definitely can. Well, basically, the, the main character, the protagonist, he's a guy who kind of has no real sense of self. He's kind of going along to get along. And, What's his age? Uh, he's mid-20s, uh, 25. Mm -hmm. And he's at a place where he's an adult. He's in the workforce, but this isn't the person that he wanted to be. But he's at a place where he has bills to pay, he has expectations of him, so he doesn't know exactly how he can get out of the space that he's kind of made for himself. And he has a girlfriend who he loves dearly, but he's so wrapped up and, and, and caught up in like tight-fisted living that he doesn't really express himself mm. to her the way that he wants to. Um, tight-fisted living. Yeah, he, he's like just that. very much so um, a wound-up kind of guy. and. Usually people like that. It kind of takes a, a jolt to get them out of that space. And the character Philip is that jolt for him. He's somebody who kind of comes along. He's a little bit mysterious. You don't really know what his motives are. And he takes him on a journey that in those seven days literally changes everything about his life. He is forced to confront a lot of things about himself. He finds out a lot of things about himself that he didn't know. Um, he never knew his father. And through that storyline in the book, he kind of starts to learn about himself through his dad as well but not directly through his father because his father has passed away at this point but it's just really a tale of a person that has never really known themselves and almost is confronted with meeting themselves for better or worse both the good and the bad parts of themselves sounds like you packed it in who, are, who are some of the writers that you uh, look up to or and inspired you any books or writers oh, that come to mind uh, so many um, actually I'm really a huge fan of James Baldwin, um, huge fan of James Baldwin. I'm really a big fan of uh, John Updike as well. I remember reading uh, the A&P, the short story, when I was at Columbia, and that story just changed things for me. And I really, really feel like I'm indebted to John Updike. Hmm. I really like uh, Chinua Achebe, who wrote the novel Things Fall Apart. Um, so, so many writers that I really, also uh, Laura Esquivel, um, who wrote Like Water for Chocolate. There's just so many writers who have kind of taken pieces of their story or story and showed me how I could make storytelling better. 
how I could really put my own stamp on these characters and make people really care about them. Because all of the authors that I just mentioned, I care about them as people, I cared about the characters they created, and my goal has always been to create characters that people could resonate with and care about and cry over and worry about and want to be like if they ever had the chance, and that's the entire point of filling in the blanks. Wait, cool. Did you ever, you, you just <clears throat> talked about you have a, uh, sort of a something of a help book that says these are not the answers. Yes. Or the, I love the title. Thank you. As Thank opposed you. to saying, here, look here, this is how you do it, which is what most self-help books yeah. do. These are not the answers. So you're bo doing both fiction and non. Yes, yes. I, I'm striving to So you got no be, limits. No. I'm, I'm a writer in every sense of the word. Um, if I can tell cool. a story in fiction, that'll be great. If I can tell a story in nonfiction, if I can do motivational speaking, all of these things that can inspire people to be creative, to be better, to be kinder to each other, any format, any way that I can do that, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, Anthony, one last question is... Uh, you know, you mentioned that the book is available on Kindle, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, did you find a publisher, or is this uh, publishing company, A3 Inc., is that you? Uh, how does that work? Uh, actually, that is me. Um, 83 Inc. is my own I'd like to get my company. books published with you. Hey, come on. <laughs> I'm, I'm the idea. kind of person that I really like to have creative control over my projects. And I wanted to literally, and this is a, a shout out to another writer who wrote a book called Steal Like an Artist, um, Austin Cleon, to where he says, write the books that you will want to read. And that's exactly what I did with Filling in the Blanks. This is a book that I would want to read. So